you are on assignment. Welcome to VOA On Assignment, where we bring you the stories behind the stories. I'm Alex Villarreal. And I'm Imran Siddiqui. Coming up, VOA goes one-on-one -on -one with General Pervez Musharraf, Pakistan's controversial former president. President Obama gives his State of the Union address. We'll hear about the history of this annual speech. Our VOA reporter returns from Northern Mali and gives us a first-hand glimpse at the fighting there. And later, we go beyond category with a new VOA music program. We're heading on assignment and we want to take you with us, so let's go. General Pervez Musharraf of Pakistan has worn many hats. President, army chief, military dictator and U.S. ally. Now, Musharraf says he will soon return to Pakistan to boost the general election chances of his party, the All-Pakistan Muslim League. General Musharraf visited VOA in January and talked about Pakistan's changing relationship with the United States, Afghanistan and the world. VOA was one of only two U.S. broadcasters that Musharraf visited, and Aisha Tanzim of Urdu TV got our exclusive interview. On assignments, Philip Alexio talked with Aisha about that. Let's roll that. Aisha Tanzim, President Pervez Musharraf has been out of the limelight for a long time. He's kind of basically been irrelevant for a while. Why did you interview him now? Well, he's announced that he's going back to Pakistan before the elections and he's going to compete. So all of a sudden, his relevance in the Pakistani politics re-emerged and I wanted to find out what his plans were and hopefully get him to announce a date. You're one of the uh, two people here in Washington who had a chance to interview him. How did you end up getting it? I'd been after his people for a long time. I've developed this kind of rapport with them and I wanted, I told them time and again, whenever he comes to DC, we want to talk to him. And uh, VOA and CNN were the only two outlets that he talked to when he was here. Now you talked to him about a variety of things. Afghanistan, you also went into the uh, war, the Cargill War back in 1999 and certainly talking about his political aspirations. Uh, let's touch quickly on Afghanistan. What were some of the most interesting things that he had talked about when you were interviewing him about that? One of the things that he said was it will not be a good idea for the U.S. to withdraw every last one of its troops. If you remember, the White House at one point during President Garzai's visit had mentioned a zero troop option. If U.S. and coalition troops withdraw lock, stock and barrel, I personally feel uh, the Taliban uh, will sweep Afghanistan and the Afghan National Army will not be able to sustain their pressure. You have also said in some of your interviews that India is trying to make an anti-Pakistan government in Afghanistan and Pakistan has the right to deter that. Do you foresee a proxy war between the two countries in Afghanistan post-2014? Uh, possibility is there, yes. Now, this book that has uh, come out from the uh, former Lieutenant General Shahid Aziz, and he's the former Chief of General Staff, and he's got some damning allegations against uh, the President. One of the reasons he's coming out now is he needs to sort of defend himself against these allegations, which focus on his actions back in 1999 during the Cargill War. Tell us a little bit about how that part of the interview went, because that really was the most intense part of it. And, and we were very lucky because ours was the first outlet where he responded to those allegations. Between if Javed I may Asen read and another line from the book, just because these allegations are against you and I want you to be able to respond, he's called it an unsound military plan based on invalid assumptions launched with little preparation and in total disregard to the regional and international environment. I totally, I consider him a person who is by design trying to a malicious propaganda against me. And I think he is not realizing what uh, damage he is doing to the interest of Pakistan army. Here is an operation which was such a successful operation, which, inflict, which gained a lot of its objectives. And here he is trying to undermine that operation. I think he's being, doing damage to Pakistan army and its cause. So are you questioning then 
uh, that this is not a person of integrity who's, yes, who's saying certainly. that. So he did call into question the credibility of the author. On the other hand, there have been others uh, since who have also made allegations uh, about that war. So when and if the general goes back home, he will really have to face those questions. Well, now, and what about if he goes back, uh, he could face, uh, you talked to him about this in the interview, that he could face high treason charges for his actions in Cargill if he were ever were to found, be found were guilty to, about that. If somebody were to bring that up now, a major opposition party in Pakistan, Pakistan Muslim League, that is the party that was in power when the military coup happened. And the Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif is the leader of the party, the Prime Minister of the, at that time. Musharraf must go immediately is the leader of the party. Now he's the main opposition party he of Pakistan, and they're saying the that if he comes back, they're going to file charges of high treason against him. And so when does he want to go back? I asked him for date. Would you like to announce on this show when you're going back to Pakistan? Um, well, I can't announce the date exactly, but... The week, maybe? Uh, you want people to receive you at the airport, right? You want, yes, of course. Yeah, so you want them to prepare now. You know, at the right time, I'll announce. At the yeah. right time. Okay, we'll, we'll wait for the, the right, right time. time. Two and a half to three months before the elections. Now, we know when the elections. When are elections? Just... The first week of May. Okay, first week of May. Okay. So, basically, that means he should be getting ready to go back any time now. Aisha Tanzim is with VOA's Urdu service. She spoke with Honest Simon's Philip Alexio. Okay, so we're about to take a break now, but first, we've got to tell you about a very exciting opportunity. You could win your very own iPad in VOA's photo contest. All you have to do is send us your best photos that capture the people and places in your life. So go to voanews.com slash iPad for details. You're watching On Assignment. U.S. President Barack Obama delivered State of the Union Address, the first of his second term in office on Tuesday night here in Washington. The speech to a joint session of Congress was watched by millions across the nation and around the world. Joining me right now is VOA reporter Laura Bowman. Thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Tell me so something. Why is there a need for the U.S. President to explain to the Congress what he does? Why, why doesn't he just wake up one morning and say, this is what I'm doing? Well, actually, it's mandated by the U.S. Constitution, so it's it's you know, a very old practice. I think the U.S. Constitution went into effect in 1789. And it says that the president must address Congress about the State of the Union. Now, the speech has evolved over the years. It, it, formerly it was letters, then it was on the radio, now it's televised, now it's tweeted, et cetera, et cetera. So now it's not just a speech to Congress, but also to the public and to the world. What about the international audience? What do you think was the most, uh, was a pivotal point as far as the foreign policy was concerned in the State of the Union? Well, the big thing here was Afghanistan. The president's saying that he's going to draw down the troops by 34,000 and that our war in Afghanistan will be over by the end of the year. That's a big deal. That's what the American public wants, and there's no dissent there. And what did you think about the Republican response? Well, it was delivered by Marco Rubio, senator from Florida. He's a very exciting figure in the Republican Party, young, um, of Cuban descent originally. Uh, that's, this is where the Republican Party wants to gain energy in the young population, et cetera. Um, his message was really anti-big government and, you know, let Americans be entrepreneurs, and that resonates with a lot of people. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Moving on, we're taking a break right now, but coming right up, we talk with our VOA French to Africa correspondent who is just back from Mali. You're watching On Assignment. About 10 months ago, Islamist extremists seized much of northern Mali, imposing Sharia law and raising fears the area could become a terrorist haven. After they began pushing south, France intervened at the request of Mali's government. The joint French-Mali force was joined by regional troops in a larger effort against those rebels. VOA correspondent Idris Fall has just returned from northern Mali, where he reported on the fighting firsthand. Let's check that out. 
France has reported successes in its mission and is planning in the next few weeks to withdraw all troops. They have retaken all the major cities which was controlled by Islamists. That is a good part of it. Uh, they took Kona, they retook Jabali, they retook Timbuktu, they retook Gao, Ansongo, Kidal. All those cities were under control of Islamists and rebels. France took it in three weeks. That's very good. But beside Kona and Jabali, there were kind of no fighting. These guys, they disappear in the nature. Nobody know where they are. And French know that. Even though they claim they killed hundreds of Islamists, the big fishes of these Islamic groups like Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar, Abu Zaid, even Aliou Mahamar, who was terrorizing the population of Gao, all those guys, they disappear. Nobody know where they are. So what happens now when France leaves? They will bring in some African troops, even within the UN mandate, but African troops, you see, they are coming very, very slowly. <laughs> so, and, then, and why is that? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I can say that African, they promise thousands of soldiers and uh, whatever. If I take my own country, Senegal, they promise 500 soldiers. They send only 50. Same for Togo, 40. The other problem is, you know, the Pentagon was training the Malian army. One of the Malian soldiers who was trained by the US is the one who did the coup in Mali. Everybody know that this is a very complicated issue. And US now is uh, uh, trying to place drone in Niger to surveillance for the Al Qaeda guys, the bad guys. But I think this will take a long time to build good government. When I was in Bamako, the policemen are harassing people on a daily basis, worse than the rebels. Mm. And they were supposed to protect them. They were supposed to even do a daily control who is who. They don't do that. They ask for your papers, you give money, you go. They arrest your car. And those kind of things, I think it will take years to build it. You talked too about neglect of the people. You have people who were victims of amputations by the extremists who are sleeping on the streets. That is another example. These two kids, you know, when they cut their hands in Gao and in Ansongo, I remember Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, to court them, brought them in front of cameras like this one, saw their hands amputated. The whole world saw that horror pictures. And then when I arrived in Bamako, I look at this kid, they're sleeping on the streets. No food. Living if even, they even don't have one dollar in their pocket. So I think human rights, it's good to talk about it, but when people live in those kind of situations, a, a little help for, to live, I think it would be a good thing. But From the international not, yeah, community. It did not happen. Yeah. <laughs> what about the case, your unique case of working for a U.S. news organization. Is that something that you were able to be vocal about or did you have to well, try to hide that? Well, I had to, <laughs> for my own survival, because you know those Islamists they are talking about, they would like to have some American hostages. So uh, w when I was there, really, I will go low profile about my passport or this country do I come from. So you were able to blend in pretty yes, well then yes. with the other journalists? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, now, <laughs> Locally, you know, I have the local color, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that worked out. Yeah, and it worked out. And it was less dangerous because, you know, when you are white there, you take a risk because uh, uh, they make money kidnapping people and it gives them also a lot of publicity, you know, because uh, yes, we grabbed some guy, the first day they will put it in on the air, we kidnap a French guy or an American guy, they love that. After that, they will ask for money or they will kill you. Our thanks to Idris for those insights. Idris Fall with VOA's French to Africa service. Now for some good news, there's a new music program at The Voice of America, Beyond Category, as host of the concert series, 
Eric Felton continues a VOA tradition of crossing cultural boundaries around the world through jazz music. Eric's program is recorded at various jazz clubs around Washington where he not only talks with the artists, he often gets up there right with them on stage and jams with them. I met up with Eric at one of these clubs called Blues Alley to talk about his show. You know, the great thing about jazz is it's music of the moment. And, uh, you know, not everything is improvised in jazz, but, but a lot of it is improvised, which means that the musicians aren't playing off of uh, an exact set of notes that have been written out, but a lot of it is spontaneous, a musical conversation. So that's typically how you stage it, then you have them perform first get a feel for their playing and then you do the interview? Well we mix up we mix up having the performance and the interview and uh, and what's great is we're able to talk about what they've just played and then get an idea of what they're gonna play next for us and get to hear it. What can you tell us about Willis Conover of course is a figure from the Voice of America. Um, is your show, are you hoping that this will be a resurgence of VOA at the at the helm of jazz? Well, yeah, VOA had this tremendous role in the history of jazz. One, broadcasting around the world, and perhaps most famously broadcasting behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, and one of the great things is that uh, the first show we taped for this new program was taped here at, at Blues Alley. And uh, with this wonderful piano player, Eldar Jangirov, who's a complete phenom, and um, when he was a kid growing up in Kyrgyzstan, his father was a jazz fan and, and turned him on to jazz originally because his father had been listening to Willis Conover on wow. VOA. So it kind of comes full circle. As a matter of fact, my, my father was, um, uh, was born um, a while ago and, and actually he was a teenager when when Stalin was ruling Soviet Union, and he actually heard um, jazz on Voice of America. That was his first um, introduction to jazz, and he carried that love throughout his whole life. This tremendous legacy that VOA has in, in being a voice of jazz around the world, of America's music, and uh, this is a wonderful opportunity uh, to, to build on that legacy. This has to be a labor of love for you. You have your own background in music. Uh, you told us, you know, that sometimes you actually get up and perform with the, the subjects of your, of your interviews and the people that you feature on your show. Tell us a little bit about your musical background and how that's influenced this program. Well, I was very fortunate. My, uh, my, my father and my grandfather were professional jazz musicians. And, uh, and so I learned from a very young age. My grandfather, who played in swing bands in the 1920s and 30s, was my trombone teacher. And uh, it was just, you know, what a wonderful childhood, you know, learning course, at my grandfather's age. All in age. the family. Yes. All in the family, absolutely. So as a player, one of the um, one of the things that I wanted to do with this show was do a little bit of, there's a wonderful piano player named Marion McPartland and she had for a long time had a radio show called Piano Jazz and she would sit with other piano players mm -hmm. um, and they'd talk about the music and they'd play things together and they'd kind of bounce off one another and it was always unpredictable and so we're taking a, a, a nod from Marion McPartland's show to, to try to capture that same unpredictability one of the, the challenges of the show that's a lot of fun is one week we may have somebody who's a, a real sort of traditional swing type of player and then the next week somebody who's doing electronica stuff and yeah. the challenge for me is to figure out how to play one with the swing guy right. and then what to play with the, the electronica guy and so it's, um, it's kind of a tight rope act and that's the fun of it and I, and I think adds a little unpredictability you know to whether <laughs> I'm going to succeed or <laughs> fail at it and, uh, and, and that makes it fun for me and I hope it makes it fun for the audience oh, as well. I, I know that it does and we've seen you succeeding very well and we see that you have your trombone sitting by your side so you are going to play a little bit for us. There's not really room to play right here so I'm going yeah, to step up to the step Blues to the Alley stage. stage. That would here be perfect. Great. <laughs>
right, so we just saw Eric Felton playing the trombone there. He also, as we saw in the piece, can play bass. And he sings, and I have a funny story about that. I actually, I went to a, a club once. It was a swing dancing uh, event, and I saw none other than Eric Felton up there singing, which was such a shock to me because I had no idea that he had that hidden talent. It's amazing. You know, wait till you watch Martin Seacrest, our executive producer, playing his guitars. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. We have a lot of uh, musical talent here yeah. at The Voice of America. That's true. Moving on. Learning an instrument may not be easy, but learning through music can be. And one award-winning teacher at a Washington area school is motivating his math students with rap music. The approach works well, especially for students who speak English as a second language. June So has the story narrated by Amy Katz. ABCs equals one, two, three. Then your solutions are not real, they're imaginary. Is this a standard form? No, it's not. So the voice in this video belongs to mathematics teacher Jake Scott. Most of the performers are his students. Watching videos is not part of their daily routine, but it is one of the essential course materials in Scott's classes at Montgomery Blair High School in the Washington suburbs. I use the rap because it's something that the stu it appeals to the students. Also because music um, aids with memory. So if I can come up with a rap and organize it and present it to the students, then helping getting that student to memorize it. Scott started using rap videos three years ago. So far, he has produced nine, including YouTube favorites Triangle Experts and Quadratic Formulatic, which have been viewed tens of thousands of times. And it's fun. The whole process is something that the students appreciate. In recent years, Scott has made a special effort to help students from other countries. Leah Sanon's family came here from the West African country of Burkina Faso two years ago. She appears in Scott's quadratic formulatic video. Before the video, I didn't remember the quadratic formula. But right after he made the video and I listened to it once, I did remember everything. Blair High School principal Renee Johnson is a big supporter. She even appears in Scott's latest video, Undefined Expressions. Mr. Scott is very motivating and engaging for students. He enjoys what he does. Scott was recognized as an outstanding educator last year by the Montgomery County Council. He was also honored as 2011 Teacher of the Year by an African American civil rights organization. One, two, three. It's undefined because you can't divide by zero. Jake Scott says he wants mathematics to be something that students look forward to learning. And he says the results will help them on a path to college and a career. For producer June So, Amy Katz, BOA News. You can't divide by zero. It's undefined because you can't divide by zero. And that is our show for this week. But Imran, before we go, perhaps you could do your own freestyle rap about our photo me. contest. <laughs> You're kidding me. I can give it a try. Uh, but yes, you could win it today. You could win your very own iPod from VOA. Hey, that's not bad. <laughs> okay, that was a fluke. All you have to do is enter our photo contest by sending us your best photos that capture the people and places in your life. Just go to voanews.com slash iPad and the contest deadline has been extended to March 1st. Be sure though when you enter to mention that you watch on assignment. Yes, and make sure that you watch us next week as well. Thank you so much for joining us.